Settle in, class, and sorry if I sound weird, I'm still figuring out the new microphone. But whether you're a DM with a green thumb or just trying to brute force a solution to your allergies, there are so many plant monsters. Even if you just narrow it down to the humanoid ones or just down to fungus. Which aren't even plants and are honestly closer to animals, but everyone thinks they're plants because they don't move. At least they normally don't, I assure you that everything we talk about today is far more mobile than you'd expect. Especially since we're talking about both D&D and Pathfinder, and I'll give you homebrew stats if whatever I mention isn't in the newest edition. Anyway, you know the drill by now, so you ready? Let's go! Now the way I see it, the plants are average adventurer needs to look out for fall into a few main categories, normal, animate, and monstrous. We voted on the humanoid subsection of monstrous, but let's get an overview. Normal is your basic poisonous plants, thorn bushes, sandbox trees, etc. I would even include the infinity vine, a vine that infests space-bearing vessels and magically grows at 10 cubic feet per minute. If left unchecked, they can completely overgrow and weigh down a ship, but it's edible and harmless, so it's really just a nuisance. In a world full of magic, you have to have more than just a mystical quirk to be considered unusual. This is for things that aren't going to mess with you unless you're careless or ignorant and mess with them. Now, of course, you should still watch out for things guarding the plants, like Bay or an orchard dragon or a farmer with a shotgun. Honestly, I would even include things like the ash tree in the burning woods from 3E. This one doesn't have stats, but it's basically an endlessly burning undead tree that reaches out to pull in nearby creatures. People will argue that means it's sentient, but that's perfectly within the realm of normal plant behavior. Sentient means you perceive and feel things, not just react to stimuli. For that, we'll have to move a step up. Creatures that blur the line between plant and animal. The classic is your shambler, shambling mound, tangla, whatever your game calls it, you gotta have a classic pile of hostile vibes. These things are also immune to and strengthened by electricity, gaining HP and then Pathfinder getting even faster. I'd also throw in Pathfinder 1E's living topiary. I know that D&D 3 had something similar with a topiary guardian. The thing is, your end result was just a normal animal with a few extra traits. I like the Pathfinder version where you're basically growing a customizable wood elemental. They like finding new types of plants to imitate and integrate, splitting themselves apart when they get big enough. And if you decide to grow your own, not only can you make it anything, there's a whole list of extra traits you can add. So yeah, it's only level 4 unless you make it from cacti wrapped in poison ivy with extra limbs so it's swinging like a stegosaurus. Not only did I make a version for these systems, I made a list of modifiers to supercharge it. And Pathfinder, I did this specifically with making an animal companion in mind. And if your DM complains about it being too weird, just point to companions like the leg chair, a chair with animal legs. Then ask them how the living topiary doesn't fit in with the arboreal sapling and wood elemental. The leaf order already has creatures like this. The leg chair is not actually relevant here, I'm just pointing it out because what do you mean you can have furniture for a companion? I mean, I did make stick on animal legs for a magic item once. You could put them on items to have them follow you around. They're great for getting big loot out of a dungeon. But I never thought to make a companion. Anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. The main focus of the day is a very specific section of plant monsters. More than just a plant that can hunt, these are people. Some keep a plant shaped like the Iron Maw, some are dragons like the Zamok. No, we're still not talking about it. Today, we're talking about the humanoid ones, mostly tree people. The ones you're probably thinking of are Dryad and Treants, or the Pathfinder equivalent Arboreals. A Treant is your standard bipedal tree, like 30 feet tall, which is honestly kind of small for a tree. They grow out of normal trees, or normal ones planted from their shoots, and just kind of wake up one day. Treants can send saplings that'll turn into treants and will guard them even more than the rest of the forest. And they can be anywhere, give them about a week, and they can look like any nearby tree. They can also animate other trees temporarily, and most importantly, they are great at besieging castles. They'll even throw the rocks they can rip down, and if you haven't noticed, somehow these are ends. It's about as subtle as me stomping my tiny butt and demanding a like and subscribe. I mean, they can't see your feet, so that's not But me. Pathfinder took these and ran with them. The classic anti known love is known as the Arboreal Region. They guard a forest, act slowly, occasionally come together in mass for months long meetings. The classic stuff. The biggest difference between the two is that they can talk to plants. But but that's not what we're here for. Occasionally, they have a local meeting called a grove, a little meet and greet to teach all the new wardens who sprouted. These are young trees, only in level 4 and like 10 or 15 feet tall, and they are active. They defend the forest by running around bashing any threat they see. If your party sets up camp in the forest, one of these running up is a great encounter. Maybe it's annoyed by the campfire and you have to convince it you only use brush. Or maybe it's on a mission you can help with, or they're just a curious kid wondering what a tent is. Our borrowers don't actively seek out the company of short-lived creatures like humans or elves, but don't tolerate the conversation if you can take their long-winded rambling. They're also weak enough that a lonely level party can actually bite them. Maybe with some weaker plans for backup, but honestly that won't be necessary. If they're not confident, they'll run and get the region, or get together in a cops to make a corpse. They don't really understand animals like us, but if you run into an arboreal, it's probably one of these, since they'll actually scout outside the forest. So I hope you don't think that's the end of them. These things just don't stop growing. A region guards one forest, but the oldest and wisest regent of an entire region gets elected as the Archive. These level 12 behemoths tap into the mycelium network of the fungi and start to learn. From now until retirement, they will track every bit of dryad gossip, warden report, rainstorm, and and logging incursion. They're wise old databases that give incredible advice, and also have magic to trip people up and rip them out of the air. And once that uppity dragon is pinned, they can use their ultimate power, a mental DDoS attack. Your brain starts bleeding as they try to force like a hundred thousand years of information into it. Uh, not that they live a hundred thousand years, remember I said they retire. When they get too old, they can slowly transfer all the information into their replacement. Of course, if they don't get a chance to, the information explodes out of them and rips apart everything. I think they act best as a set piece. High level adventurers seeking them out for information, and if it won't talk willingly, maybe 
maybe they can taunt it and see if they can get the information from the plan. Or it's a mock battle to prove they can follow through with their plan. But there is another kind of famous plan person, the Dryad. They're either Bane-like plans or Bay bonded to plans, and it really just depends on when and where they're classified. They can talk to plants or animals, have magic to tangle people in vines or charm them, and the D&D version can charm someone for a full day. One person and three animals to be precise. And they'll keep someone as a pet for years if they really like them. I mean, it makes sense. They're Faye being punished for loving people too much. Now they're just a weak challenge one Faye bound to guard a forest, and especially the tree their life is bonded to. That works great for adventure hooks since they can't leave the area. Or maybe the party needs your companion. They might have information they need, or maybe they're a local baron's heir. The party sent to slay a kidnapper, but the baron just wants to burn down the forest and they're being kept as insurance. Or maybe they're lovers and perfectly happy together. And yeah, they're charmed, but not because they need to be, they're just into it. Now the Pathfinder version is slightly different, with them being a kind of nymph, a fae guardian manifestation of a natural concept. The Dryad is the woodland. They prefer being tricky to fighting as they're only level 3, and honestly don't bother with people unless they're messing with the woods. A town that respects nature can have a local dryad and have no idea. Being away from their tree for more than a day weakens them, but unlike their D&D counterpart, it doesn't kill them. Given time, they can even bond to a new one. They can temporarily merge with any tree, but their tree has an extra dimensional room inside, and she can even bring friends. Maybe some people go missing, but it turns out they just want to live in the dryad's tree. Maybe now there's even three people who want to stay, so the party's gotta find some artifact and let her expand the room. And also like the D&D version, that's not the only dryad. In Pathfinder, the next step up is the queen, and instead of being tied to a tree, the entire forest is tied to her, or at least a chunk of the forest if it's a really big one. If she's happy, it's thriving, if she's hurt, it wilts, and if she starts to lose it, the whole place becomes twisted. They're in charge of local dryads and have court with other powerful pay in the region, often more sinister ones, with her being the beauty of the forest and them the wrath. Don't get it wrong though, she is both, with that beauty immobilizing people who get too close. And from there, she can straight up ban you from being hostile to her for an hour. If she does like you though, she can give you a token like a lock of hair for a bunch of little bonuses. And if you're a bard, you can choose her as your muse for an even bigger effect. Oh, and did I mention that she has prepared spells up to rank 7, like Regenerate and Chain Lightning and Howling Blizzard? Also a few innate ones up to rank 8. So things like Charm and Entangling Flora on top of spells like Impaling Briars. She can also shapeshift into normal dryads and other humanoids, so be careful with everyone you meet in the woods. Thankfully, you can use these without having them fighting level 13 powerhouse with an entire forest of magical creatures at their disposal. Maybe the party gets hired as guards as she goes to meet with the Mosquito Witch. Or maybe some hags are trying to corrupt the forest by cursing their queen. The party might have to do it because they have wards to drive off fame. Or maybe they're shapeshifted and infiltrated the court. Then the party can be investigators and suss out who's the imposter. Uh. However, on the D&D side, things get dark and fast if we go past CR1. At level 9, we have the Conclave, who's a Magic the Gathering crossover. These things have the usual spell casting, but with stronger magic like Wall of Thorns and Moonbeam. They can entangle when they bonk you and summon a magic plant elk for a mount. But most importantly, these aren't bound to trees. Where they're from, the forest are gone. They're just trying to lead cities to harmony with nature. Apparently, they're both spiritual leaders and architects. And now I'm just imagining them in PPE arguing with a foreman, which is just too funny to work with. So let's look at the real meat of these. Vecna Eye of Ruin brought us the mighty dead bark dryad. Equal and challenge to Pathfinder's queen, but there's no helping this one. These are incredibly powerful dryads who can't let go of how they failed to protect their home. Their forest is now a swampy grave of nettles and muck, and those who bring life to it shall die. They shoot Benmus thorns and grapple with necrotic vines, but they barely have any magic left. Instead of a tree, they're just bound to the spot of their failure. They're still technically bay, but I would pair them with the undead they're acting like. Maybe as a lair action, you can have zombie animals walk by for a few bites. Maybe other dryad spirits haunt the woods as banshees, met by a deathlock who wants true power from her. Maybe her bonded tree is still around as an undead treant. Pathfinder has those. What, you didn't think I was done with Arboreals, did ya? The Arboreal Snag is an undead warden, like a zombie tree attacking anything it sees. A forest can die just from these things punching all the animals until they leave. They're a great way to twist up the classic necromancer. And if you really want to spook the party, have them strike a logging camp with a swarm of zombie squirrels or logger skeletons. Then watch the party panic when they realize how horrible things can go if they can even turn the trees to zombies. All they can really do is throw rocks and grab you, but piercing attacks make them spray you with sickening sap. There's even variants that can heal by draining buried bodies or shower everyone in poisonous petals. So if level 3 is a bit too weak, try the Burning Tundra's Arboreal Tar Tree. These are basically vampire regions. They could be the plot twist necromancer. However, the biggest difference between them and a normal region is that if they kill an Arboreal, it becomes a weakened version of itself under the tree's control. At least until the Tar Tree dies, where all the thralls regain their full will and become Tar Trees in full. Note that there's no limit to how many thralls they can have, and you might see how this can spiral. Have the party fight them with some warden allies who then start falling. On the bright side, they do have a weakness to axes, so you might want to invest in one. D&D's bites are a somewhat similar concept, born from the stake in a powerful vampire growing and making endless thralls. It's called a Gonthias tree after the first vampire to spawn one, and has never really had a full stat block. Any plant infected by an evil mind can become one. If you wanted to bite back, I would boost up an undead tree or tree blight, but honestly, and it really hurts to say this, don't. The issue is that all blights are incredibly weak, like they're ranging from CR 1 to 1 8th. Blights are best as hordes of creatures the party can't talk to, a starting adventure to get the party up to level 3, or the set dressing for an actual challenge. And honestly, I kinda think they let the premise down. The Twig and Needle Blight just have a basic attack and ambush people. Vine Blights constrict people and summon grasping vines. Oh, 
when they have a flavor text that they drink blood. And until someone recently, that's all there were, with a bind bite being a whopping 0.5 challenge rating. For Pathfinder people, that's level 0 and potentially weaker than your D&D wizard's familiar. But then we got the Astro Bite, a bind bite that glows, and the Razor Bind Bite that does actually drink your blood. Now they're CR1, they might actually hurt someone. But do you get my point? Outside the most basic Hunt the Evil Tree quest, I would use them as a background threat or force of nature. The townsfolk are terrified and you're wondering if they're overqualified, but then you find the layer of the evil druid or undead forest dragon or whatever actually planted the tree. I would use a corrupted dryad because the only other kind of blight is a tree blight and you really don't want to use that as the base. They're carnivorous trees that hate each other and grapple people with roots. Once again, this is just flavorful cannon fodder. And there's nothing wrong with fodder, this one's even interesting, but it shouldn't be the actual climatic bite even if it is CR7. Now what you could do is have it be a corrupted wood woad. There's CR5, so right in that sweet spot to make a good boss while the bites are still a nuisance. A wood woad is made by ripping someone's still beating heart out and replacing it with a seed. Then you put them in a tree, water with the blood, bury in the roots, and boom, you get a wood woad. Druids do this to make nature guardians, but maybe the ritual went wrong because the person wasn't willing. Still fairly basic, but they have regeneration and can teleport through trees. Just pair it with some pine bites, scatter thorn bushes to limit movement, and you've got a pretty decent early boss. But if you want something that looks creepy without actually being undead, welcome Pathfinder's Reaper Arboreal. They look like they've been chopped to pieces because they focus on decay and incorporate the wreckage into themselves. Once the ruin's gone, they move on and focus on decay in the forest in general. It's an important part of life, especially in fall and winter where they're alarmingly active for a mature arboreal. Trees take up a lot of space even after they die, so they make mushroom blooms to break them down. Now all that said, they are promoting decay for the health of the forest. They're level 7 and if you mess with the woods, they will rip all the water out of your body or just drain it through more mundane means like bleeding. As for conflict, maybe the party needs something for the ruins they spawned from. They need to take it down or negotiate with it. And these things could be such an eerie quest giver. Maybe it wants to break down some ruins, but there's something inside that's stopping the stone from cracking. And they wouldn't normally ask for help, but they're just too big to fit inside. Or maybe the party thinks it's guarding the woods of an evil necromancer. But honestly, it doesn't care about either of them. As long as you're not trying to burn down the woods, animal affairs are none of its concern. Come to think of it, in a big city, I could see a whole grove springing up at once. Of course, you'd either need to save that for stronger parties or weaken the damage on the leeching attack and make them barely mobile. A sprout could be an environmental hazard or trap. The reaper is honestly pretty different from other arboreals because it's a separate species. The rest are the same creature, but at different ages or after rituals. Speaking of which, there's actually one more stage and then we're done with them, I promise. The canopy elder is what can happen to the oldest of arboreals. It takes thousands of years of bonding to a jungle, but these 200 foot behemoths are the pinnacle of plant kind. Found in King of the Mountain, their basic attacks can grab, trip, or punch. They can speak to animals and plants like the ones living in them, who will rush to defend them at a moment's notice. If the surprise giant snakes and carnivorous plants and tripping mushrooms aren't enough, they can heal themselves, release fungal webs, and shoot out blinding clouds of pollen. The bug says you're immune to the sickening part of pollen for an entire day once you're exposed, but that's garbage. Sounds like the writer hasn't had to clean pollen off their windows with a rubber snow scraper before. It doesn't matter if you're allergic, pollen can make you sick all day from sheer volume, but you won't notice because its final trick is four uses of nature's enmity. Congratulations, nature hates you now. Every blade of grass is trying to trip you, every round we see if a random swarm attacks you. Animals and plants, even your companion, will turn on you and primal spells have a failure chance as nature tries to take its magic back. I don't know what sort of wonderbread once there you'd have to be to try to kill the heart of a jungle, but good luck when you're up against a level 19 siege engine. Maybe the party tries to run past it to a dungeon, or maybe it is the dungeon. I mean, the thing's 20 stories tall, maybe you have to find a parasite. Or you could let the party befriend it and ride it into an epic final battle. Now, I know we're about to run over on time, but let's do a little lightning round. I mean, I know today was just tree people, but we can't ignore the Leshy. That's right, step on up to Pathfinder's unofficial second mascot. You want plant people? We got plant people on every kind you can imagine. Seaweed, sunflower, fungus, gourd. If you're a summoner, try making a binder fly trap fleshy. And if you want to be a plant person, you are in luck. Use your heritage to glide as a leaf fleshy or make spines like a cactus or grow like a pine. And with this many feeds, it's easy to adapt to any plant. Or take the harmlessly cute feet because come on, you're just a little guy. And I say we need to bring back the mushies from last edition. Like the sleepy little lotus mushy or the snap dragon mushy who's a bard that ties you up and fills you with laughing gas? Did I grab the right script? Anyway, that's not half of what mushies can do. But if we talk about every lichen mushy, I'll be here all day. So how about we just squeeze in a few and visit more next time? Is this just so we don't gotta- Yes, it's so we don't have to make 16 more homebrews and we're already making like 25. Why can't it be like other YouTubers and just make one? Because you love making monsters. Always being rhetorical. Anyway, the Leaf Fleshy is a crowd favorite, especially since they're so cute now. But don't think they're just making them all cutesy. Look at the cactus. They're nature spirits inhabiting plants, so it depends on the plant they fused with in the ritual. Leaf Fleshies make armor out of pine cones, glide like a falling leaf with their cape, and I love them. And they're not defenseless. They're two foot tall with spears and deafening seed pods. They can also speak with trees and turn into a tree at will, so if you lose sight of them, you're never gonna find them. They love doing little mock battles and they'll go for hit and run tactics in a pinch, but they'd rather run to get bayer arboreals instead. Or just stronger leshies like the fly trap. On their own, fly traps are the most deadly leshy at level 4. They've got acidic, sickening mouth hands, a bigger one for the bite with a ranged acid spit, and can turn into normal fly traps. They even have attacks of opportunity, which is actually pretty rare in Pathfinder, especially.
especially at low level. However, there's a reason I said on their own, because they rarely are. They get along with other meshies, but with other fight traps, they form an insanely deadly polycule. I'm not even joking, they're all in a massive relationship web with others in their forest. Because why not when you fuse with them? These things fuse Steven Universe style into an amalgam, becoming stronger and harder to hit with an extra opportunity attack. Now you know I love this sort of stuff, and this is a big exception, because this version stops at 1. Back in the old days of Pathfinder 1, they could keep piling into a massive fusion with more bites that got bigger and bigger. 30 of them could fuse into a gargantuan pile to terrify an unwitting adventurer. So I went ahead and made something extra. First an amalgam that fused so long that became the same creature, and the second is a whole group combined. My solution to their added heads is a big attack that does more for each bite, and a flurry that hits everyone in range as long as they have the heads. Now what confuses me is that I took this elegant solution from the other giant fly trap. I wonder why they didn't just use that. Oh well, if carnivorous poly plants aren't enough for you, how about we get into something more seasonal? Would you like a creepy little creature of rotten decay? Well, too bad. Instead, the section is for the gourds. I mean, just look at the little guy. Their little punches and seeds make vines grow on you to slow you down, and if they put something in their head, it gets fixed and is protected from divination magic. They can also speak with and turn into normal gourds. They like to hang around in fields and gardens to secretly protect people, and I just think they're neat. Not everyone's gotta be good at fighting. I know some of you saw this thing and thought of how quickly your party would adopt it. Now that said, spitting seeds that entangle would make it a great support for other guardians or fame. Maybe a dryad tree growing an old pumpkin patch, or they're working alongside a house spirit. And remember that they don't have to be pumpkins, they could be squash or zucchini. If you live by people who grow zucchini, you know they probably don't even care that it's running around. If it runs off, it's honestly just saving them some work. But of course, I couldn't resist making one myself, so here is the maze nashi. They can make a little maze maze by your kernels from their hands and jump when taking fire damage, because popcorn. Let's say they're friendly and hyperactive tricksters. They help guard fields and try to suddenly improve relationships, but they also do some of the mischief that gets chalked up to pain. Like all nashis, they leave an explosive growth of their plant when they die, but in this case it actually works great as a reference. Maze growing from someone's death is kinda just how it goes in most origin stories. Speaking of which, how do we make them? They don't really say in Pathfinder 2e, but we notice a trend in 1e where they do. You need a varying amount of gold's worth of materials, a nature check, and the casting of plant growth, summon nature's ally, and a thematic spell to show their body how to act. For a leaf fleshy, you plant an acorn and pinecone and a mound of leaves and nettles and cast magic stone for its seeds. Fly trap fleshies require a burst of nettles for their acid damage and you have to feed them a pound of freshly killed insects. Cord fleshies need you to carve their face or they'll be blind and mute. And you need to know Entangle so their punch does too. And ignoring the sudden ideas for what could happen if you use the wrong spell, what does this say about our maze nashi? I think we'll have them planted with some sort of rendered fat and require wall of straps. The wall for the maze maze and fat because buttered popcorn. Sometimes magic should be silly. We'll have to do a follow up sometime. There are so many kinds of plants. I hope y'all enjoyed, especially my copy supporters, Beryl Goblin, Modern Masquerade, Dr. Mug, Snake Oil, and Level 1 Cleric. Thanks to you, I probably sound different. It'll get better in time. I haven't really had a moment to mess with my settings. It has been a hectic month and I doubt it's slowing down soon, especially if I keep accidentally tapping mute. But whatever, I'm just rambling like always. Class dismissed.